This is our review on biomolecules, everything that we need to know about everything. Lots of things that we need to know about these four classes of biomolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. So for each of those four classes, we should know what some of the monomers are, the polymers. We should know structure, bonding, and function. So for carbohydrates, um, monomers are monosaccharides. These are just guys that have one tiny little piece of sugar. Glucose, fructose, galactose, ribose, of course. Deoxyribose is another example of a monosaccharide. Polymers are going to be bigger chunks. So when I start binding these monosaccharides together, we end up with polymers, um, which are simply more complex versions of these carbohydrates. So two different kinds of carbohydrates, we have disaccharides and polysaccharides. Di is two, poly is many. So some of the examples of disaccharides that we need to know, maltose, sucrose, lactose, know that glucose, glucose makes maltose, glucose, fructose makes sucrose, glucose, galactose makes lactose. These are all examples of alpha glucose. We animals do have the enzymes to break down alpha glucose um, polymers. Polysaccharides are much, 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 much bigger than disaccharides, many instead of just two. Examples that you need to know are starch, glycogen, and cellulose. Starch and glycogen are both energy storage polysaccharides, starch for plants, glycogen for animals. Starch comes in two forms, um, or there are two components that make up starch. So we've got amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is a straight chain of alpha glucose molecules bonded together with those glycosidic bonds in one four patterns. So in biochemistry, we love to count the carbons. So if I take carbon number one of one glucose molecule and I stick it onto carbon number four of another glucose molecule, then this is going to lead to a straight chain of glucose molecules, and that's what amylose is. Amylopectin is a little bit more complex. So it's got those one fours, but then it also has some one sixes. So carbon number one of one glucose molecule, carbon number six of a different one, is actually going to take us from, imagine that all those little circles are glucoses. So I have uh, one, four, one, four, one, four. But if I take a, uh, there's also a, a carbon number six up here. So if I take carbon number one of somebody else, and I stay down to carbon number six of one of these guys, then I end up with a branch. That's what amylopectin is. It's got one four and one six glycosidic bonds. Glycogen is the animal version of starch, one four and one six glycosidic bonds, which means that it is branched like amylopectin. Cellulose is in plants only. Instead of alpha glucose, it's now beta glucose. We animals do not make the enzyme to break down polymers of beta glucose. And so cellulose for us is fiber, which is good. It's not a bad thing. We can't break it down. Fiber is important for our diet. Um, it is straight chain because it's one for plants use it um, to build cell walls. So it's a structural carbohydrate as opposed to an energy storage carbohydrate. Structure of carbohydrates, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen are the only elements that you're going to find in carbohydrates. The ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is 2 to 1, just like water is a 2 to 1 ratio of hydrogen to oxygen, which is why we call it hydrate, because it's carbohydrate. Bonding, um, I mentioned this word earlier, there's glycosidic bonds between the monomers to build our polymers and carbohydrates, and their function is either energy, glycogen, starch, and then our quick energy guys, glucose, fructose, or disaccharides, um, and then structure if we're talking about cellulose. Here are some pictures of our um, carbohydrates. So this clearly is a single guy, so it's a monosaccharide, it is in fact glucose. And I would count it, count the carbons, one, carbon number two, carbon number three, whoa, that's a three, C, four, five, and then this guy up here is carbon number six. This is a dimer or a disaccharide because there's one, two little pieces. This one is, is sucrose because this is glucose and this is fructose. Here we have some uh, representations of our polysaccharides. So amylose plus amylopectin is going to make up starch. You can see that amylose is a straight chain. Amylopectin has those branches because it's not just one four, but one four and one six. This is glycogen. This is the animal version of starch. Um, and this is cellulose. 
So we have straight chains, but then there's some hydrogen bonding between those straight chains, and this is what makes cellulose such a great structural component for cell walls. Our next uh, class of biomolecule are lipids. So lipids, we talk about them kind of sort of with monomers and polymers, but the polymers are not very big. Um, as opposed to in our carbohydrates, where we're talking about starch that's composed of hundreds and hundreds of glucose molecules, polymers of lipids aren't really that big. And so polymer is probably not the best word to use, um, but, but we can glue together fatty acids, which are some of the monomers of lipids, into triglycerides. There's only three fatty acids, so not hundreds, like in our polysaccharides, but still a little bit bigger. So again, the monomers are fatty acids, and then we've got also some steroid molecules, testosterone, cholesterol, that kind of stuff, um, are lipids that aren't fatty acids. Um, polymers, again, not the greatest word to call them, but we can glue together one glycerol molecule and three fatty acids to build triglycerides. The structure of lipids are similar to carbohydrates in that there's only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but what's different between lipids and carbohydrates is that there's very little oxygen in lipids. So in our carbohydrates, we always had half as many oxygens as hydrogens. In our lipids, we're going to have like three or four oxygens and maybe 20 hydrogens. So definitely no longer in a two to one ratio like we had in carbohydrates. Um, the bonding, we actually build ester bonds when we build our triglycerides between glycerol and fatty acids. I have a picture on the next slide to show what that ester bond looks like. And then function is definitely going to be long-term energy storage. So our carbohydrates, we can break apart pretty quickly to make ATP fairly quickly. Um, lipids we store in our bodies so that we can access energy later um, should there be a problem accessing carbohydrates in our diet. Lipids also act as protection. They cushion a lot of our organs. Um, our heart sits right behind the, the breastbone, behind the sternum. You can imagine that if that heart muscle was rubbing up against that bone all the time, every time it beat, it would, it would be damaged. It would be scarred. And so our hearts have this lovely little layer of fat around it um, to help cushion the heart, to protect the heart from the bone. And then, of course, our cold weather critters, um, guys that live, especially at the poles, are going to pack on some fat um, to act as insulation for uh, that cold weather. So here are some examples of lipids. This is a triglyceride. triglyceride. Um, this part of the um, chunk was glycerol, and then these are our one, two, three fatty acids that are stuck. This bond, this bond, this bond, these are all what we call ester bonds um, when we bind together our fatty acid to our glycerol. This is the other kind of um, lipid. This is a steroid, this one in particular is cholesterol. You can see in both of these guys that we've got lots of carbons, lots of hydrogens. Remember that each one of these guys is a carbon. And each one of these carbons needs four bonds. So right now we only have one, two bonds on that carbon, which means that there are also two invisible hydrogens sitting there. So we've got lots of carbons, carbon, carbon, carbon. All of those guys are carbons. All those carbons have two hydrogens on them. Lots and lots of carbons and hydrogens. And we've only got one, two, three, four, five, six oxygens. This guy, carbon, carbon, carbon. All these guys are carbons. And then we've got lots of hydrogens around. Again, these guys are all going to have... Um, some hydrogens to fill up their bonding. Um, he, he has one oxygen, one oxygen on that whole thing, and oodles and oodles of hydrogen. So, so when you're trying to differentiate between a lipid and a carbohydrate, look for the number of oxygens. Just a couple oxygens, we're talking about a lipid. If we have fairly equal numbers of oxygens and carbons, then we're more likely looking at a carbohydrate. So here are three different kinds of fatty acids that we need to know. So saturated fatty acids have notable bonds. Um, this chunk of the fatty acid is called the carboxyl group, carboxyl group, um, and this is what's going to glue onto a glycerol molecule to make a, an ester bond. The rest of it is the carbon chain. Um, if there are no double bonds between the carbons, if there are no double bonds between the carbons, we're going to call it saturated. If there are double bonds between the carbons, they're always only between the carbons, you can't impossible to build a double bond between hydrogen and carbon, so it's never going to be there. It's always going to be between carbons. If we're building double bonds between carbons, then it's an unsaturated fatty acid. 
there's only one double bond, it's mono unsaturated. If there are lots of double bonds, well, more than one, then it's polyunsaturated. So those double bonds can result in hydrogens being either left over on the same side of the chain, or they can be on opposite sides of the chain. So if we end up with hydrogen on one side and hydrogen on the opposite side, we're going to call this a trans unsaturated fatty acid. These actually aren't much better for our health than are the saturated fatty acids. But if I can get these hydrogens to stay on the same side, we're going to call that cis, the leftover hydrogens are on the same side. What happens is we end up with a pretty big hole right here because those hydrogens are missing, which allows the molecule to kind of fold in a little bit more. This bent configuration, this kink in the fatty acid chain is going to prevent the fatty acids from packing together. Um, and the more packed these guys can stay, these two guys can pack pretty nicely just because they're so kind of straight, they can kind of pack up a little bit better. These guys are the ones that um, can clog our arteries because they do pack up so well. These guys, because they've got that bend in there, they, they can't really stick together quite as well as these guys. And so there's a less likely chance of these fatty acids clogging arteries. Looking at proteins, so the monomers of proteins are amino acids. There are about 20 of them, or 21 or 22, depending on who you're talking to. Um, so these amino acids can be glued together with peptide bonds to form polypeptides. The structure, you're looking for carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and now nitrogen. Um, sometimes you're also going to get some sulfur, and sulfur is... Um, in the amino acid cysteine, sulfur is unique to protein. Carbon or carbohydrates, lipids, and nucleic acids have no sulfur. So if you've got a, a compound that has sulfur in it, it's going to be a protein. Um, structural levels, and I have a slide coming up with pictures, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary levels of structure of proteins. They are bonded together with peptide bonds. When you take the carboxylic acid group of one amino acid, the amino group of the next, we glue them together. Um, in a condensation reaction. Functions of proteins can be either metabolic or structural. Globular proteins are more likely to be metabolic. Those are enzymes. Their names are going to end in ACE, like lactase, or ATP synthase, or amylase. If it ends in an ACE, it's going to be an enzyme. Um, most likely globular, which is going to have quite a bit more tertiary structure as opposed to our structural proteins, um, which are more fibrous, they're long and stringy. Collagen, keratin, spider silk are all examples of structural proteins. So the primary protein structure is just the sequence of amino acids. So I've got cysteine, alanine, um, proline, whatever other amino acids we've got in this chain. That's our primary structure, the order of amino acids that are glued together with those peptide bonds. The secondary structure can be either alpha helix or beta pleated sheet. So alpha helix is going to twist around. Um, we've got some hydrogen bonding between um, amino acids in the chain. Beta pleated sheet, this is going to be less of a curly Q and more of some folding. So, so again, we've got some hydrogen bonding happening between different amino acids. Um, but instead of short curly cues, now I've got longer folds. So alpha helix beta pleated sheet. Held together only with hydrogen bonds. So that's super important. Um, secondary structure is held together, hydrogen bonding only. Tertiary structure, so now we're doing a little bit more three-dimensional folding. We're going to add um, some more different kinds of bonding. So there is still some hydrogen bonding. But now we've also got ionic and covalent. There's a special kind of covalent bond called a disulfide bridge. Um, so the amino acid cysteine has sulfur in it. So if one cysteine's sulfur finds another cysteine's sulfur, these two sulfurs are going to bond together in what we call a disulfide bridge, which holds that three-dimensional structure together quite nicely. So our...
Our fibrous proteins are going to have a lot less tertiary structure, if any at all, whereas our globular proteins are going to have oodles and oodles of tertiary structure. The fourth level, the quaternary protein structure, so now what happens is I take one of these guys, and then I have an entirely different one of those guys, and they stick together with hydrogen bonds, covalent bonds, disulfide, which is ionic bonds, and then I have a functional protein consisting of more than one amino acid chain. Um, so how these amino acids glue together, how they form a peptide bond, we're going to take the oxygen hydrogen off of the carboxylic group, so the carboxyl group, the carboxylic acid group of one amino acid. This is the amino group of another amino acid. Take the hydrogen off the amino group, the OH, the hydroxyl off of the carboxyl group, this H12H2O gets sucked out as water, and then this carbon and this nitrogen stick together here in this peptide bond. So here's our peptide bond. Um, the remaining chunk of this amino acid is here. The leftover chunk of this amino acid is here. Um, and then we make a dipeptide amino acid one, amino acid two. Two amino acids glued together makes a dipeptide. Proteins, again, can be more fibrous, like collagen, long, and stringy. These guys are more likely to be structural. Or we can have a more globular protein, like this guy's myoglobin. Um, it helps muscles grab oxygen away from hemoglobin on red blood cells so that it can carry out ATP synthesis. A lot more tertiary structure, even quaternary structure, in our globular proteins. Fibrous proteins are going to have far less folding. Final kind of biomolecule to look at are the nucleic acids. The two versions that we need to know are DNA and RNA. The monomers of nucleic acids are called nucleotides. In DNA, there are four nucleotides, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine. In RNA, we have adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil. So uracil versus thymine um, is one difference between DNA and RNA. Polymers of nucleic acids, that's just our DNA and our RNA molecule structure. We're going to have, again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but now we've got phosphorus. So phosphorus is unique to DNA and RNA. Um, no other of our classes of biomolecules have phosphorus. Um, another structural piece, DNA is a double helix. The complementary bases are held together with hydrogen bonds. RNA, however, is a single helix. So still curly, just not... A double curly. Um, bonding, so we are going to hold different nucleotides together, what we call a phosphodiester bond, between the five prime carbon of the phosphate group of one nucleotide and then the three prime carbon of whatever sugar, deoxyribose, or ribose that we have on the next one. Function is inheritance, um, and, and part of inheritance is um, how we make our proteins. And so these specific um, our proteome, our specific proteome, our, whoa, proteome, um, our collection of proteins is what makes us who we are. And the DNA and RNA help us make those proteins. So here's just a quick uh, graphic showing us differences between DNA and RNA. DNA, of course, is the double helix. Um, the double uh, helices are held together by hydrogen bonds. These are hydrogen bonds between complementary nitrogenous bases. Adenine is complementary to thymine, and cytosine is complementary to guanine. As opposed to our uh, RNA, which is single stranded, so just one helix. Um, adenine, guanine, cytosine are common to both. DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil. And then the D versus R, the D is for deoxyribose, that's the sugar that is in DNA as opposed to ribose, which is the sugar in RNA. Um, and you can see that the one little difference is um, here is an oxygen, and here we took an oxygen off, so that's the D. Oxy, it was unoxygenated um, in that one spot. So final slide of this review video that's gone on a little bit longer than I had planned to. So sorry that I'm rambling.
Um, so metabolism in general, what we do is we take our monomers, our little pieces of um, our nucleotides or our amino acids or our monosaccharides, and we use energy to um, carry out anabolic reactions. We're going to build these monomers into polymers. We're going to glue them together into big pieces. So, so when I put together amino acids on the ribosomes to make my proteins, that's anabolism energy is invested um, in the form of ATP. When I chop my polymers down into little pieces, that's now catabolism, we're chopping things up into smaller pieces. Um, energy is released, and then we take our big chunks down into monomers. This is, this is a lot of digestion. Um, and the benefit of hydrolysis reactions, this is hydrolysis, this is condensation. Um, the benefit of hydrolysis to digestion is that we can take these big pieces of food and we can break it down into monomers, which can be absorbed into the bloodstream, can be um, dissolved in blood, transported through the blood, um, um, pulled into cells, and the cells can use those pieces to make more of us um, through anabolism. Catabolism, we chop up our food into little pieces. Anabolism, we take the little pieces of our food to make more of us. Uh, and then here's just a close-up look at those two different reactions. So dehydration synthesis, um, in IV, we actually call it condensation. This condensation reaction, we're sucking water out by gluing together two little pieces. This is our anabolism, anabolic reaction, building things from monomers into dimers or into bigger things than dimers. Then the opposite is hydrolysis, which is our digestion reaction, where we add some water and of course, some enzymes. We can break the bond between two monomers and uh, chunk those pieces of water onto opposite pieces. And then we end up with stuff broken down. Here are our monomers that we can then absorb into the bloodstream, transport through the bloodstream, um, pack into cells to make more of us. If you have questions, let me know.